they wanted me to have their um, son come who was involved in uh, praise dancing. And I said, well, we don't do that here. Uh, and of course she said, why? I said, well, because praise dancing is not in the Bible and we just don't uh, feel that God has called us in that direction. Uh, and so she said, well, you got to give the young people something to, to do. I said, yeah, they're supposed to live holy. You know, that's, that's, that, that's enough right there. You know, and, and she said, well, you mean that all your young people do is just come to church and hear the word and sing and that's it? I said, well, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know, and uh, uh, I don't believe that we have to borrow from any of the things of the world uh, uh, to uh, accommodate us because it's not going to help us spiritually at all anyway. I just don't believe that we owe the flesh anything. Paul said we are not debtors to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. We lived our lives for so many years in the world and now it's time to give God that time by allowing him to live his life through us. And I never read where Jesus was breakdancing down there with the apostles in Jerusalem. You know, so, so we let him live his life through us because he gave his life for us and and um, uh, you know these people that are involved in these praise dancers a lot of them are not saved a lot of them don't live holy uh, the young man that they wanted me to allow here to come dance is, is uh, was shacking up with a girl or, or something he was doing uh, and we just don't want those kinds of things here. I was approached by a pastor that him and his son has a music ministry and they wanted to come here and do a couple songs and rap a couple songs to us. And I had to let him know. I said, well, I said, that sounds interesting. You know, and uh, I said, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back with you. Well, uh, we we're still getting back with him. You know, it might be at the Great White Throne of Judgment we get back with him and uh, whatever, but we just, we just don't, um, we're just not going to compromise. I don't think we need any of those things. Those things are not going to add to our spiritual life. All they're going to do is um, uh, uh, cater to the fallen nature, you know, appeal to the flesh, and the flesh has enough uh, going on that appeals to it in the first place. Can we say amen? I mean, we feed the flesh. Some days uh, uh, we have a certain desire for a certain kind of food. You know, mama might get in the kitchen and cook, and then we get home, and then we like, oh, I didn't have a taste for that. You know, and uh, uh, I wanted something else. Well, that's that's the flesh. You might not have had a taste for for that. You wanted something else. So we already cater to the flesh enough every day. You know, we might have a sweet tooth. We go out and get us something sweet to eat because that's what our flesh is craving for. We might uh, get tired of drinking uh, juice. We might want a pop or some tea or something like that. We already cater to the flesh as it is. And so we don't need to formulate our church services to cater to the flesh anymore. We might as well focus on the spiritual man. Can we say amen? You know, and I think that that's what works. It's what's kept me safe all these years. And I, and I believe that that's what God wants us to do. All right. Well, we're going to teach on a subject we haven't taught on in a while. And that is the right hand of God. Uh, the right hand of God. And let us look at the gospel according to St. Saint uh, Saint Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 19. The gospel according to St. Mark. Chapter 16 and verse number 19. The right hand of God. What does it mean when the Bible says the right hand of God? Well, a lot of people like to approach the Bible with their own preconceived understandings. They'll see a particular word in the Bible and because it is a word that they are familiar with and have been familiar with, uh, they immediately assume that they understand what that word means. Uh, but what we have to realize is that uh, a Bible dictionary is different than from a Webster's dictionary. And a word 
can mean one thing today, but mean something completely different in Bible times. And I have a list of almost a thousand words in my library uh, of words that have changed in meaning since the Bible was um, uh, printed in 1611. One of those words is let. In 1611, the word let meant to hinder or impede. But today, it means completely opposite. It means to allow or permit. And so a lot of times, we approach the Bible with our own preconceived understandings based upon what we feel that we know, based upon words and different things of, of that nature. And the right hand of God is one of those things. Because you see pictures of God sitting in a big chair and Jesus sitting on the right side in a smaller chair and the father pats him on the head every now and then because you see a picture of, of, the, of, of God the father uh, sitting on the throne with a long white beard and the son like a little boy as if Jesus is still a child nowadays and pats him on the head and then you look on the right left side and the Holy Ghost is in the form of a bird. Actually the Holy Ghost is a bird uh, on the left side and the Holy Ghost is not a bird but, or a dove but uh, it um, represents that when uh, Jesus was baptized came down in the form of a dove. So they equate then Jesus being on the right hand of God as being on the right side of God. But God does not have a right side because he fills all space and time and solid matter. You can never get on the outside of him because he's filling all sides. And I was talking to uh, some ministers on one occasion and I was expressing to them what the Bible teaches about Jesus being God, that we're Jesus only. They said, well, the Bible says Jesus is sitting on the right side of God. I said, no, the Bible doesn't say that. It says right hand. And they said, well, that's what that means. I said, no, that's what you assume that it means. But in the Bible, it is saying something different. It doesn't say right side. It says right hand. And you think of it like this. Um, you may have a close friend and you might say that's my right hand man or that's my right hand um, girl yes. that means that they are your favorite they're the ones that you lean on or what have you and it is in this sense uh, as to what the right hand of God means and that's just one definition of it so let's look at Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 19 all right, and if we have it, let's read. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now, the right hand of God means three things. First of all, it is the place of favor. And we're going to look at that and establish all these three things with the scripture. The place of favor. When it says he's on the right hand of God, that means he's in the place of the favor of God. The right hand of God, the favor. The place of the power, or the place of power. When it says Jesus is on the right hand of God, it means he's in the place of power. And the right hand of God means the place of the Spirit. And all of these expressions simply make the point that he is right on the throne. Him being in the place of favor, he's in the place of power, he's in the place of the spirit, which is right on the throne because he is God. Now the scripture talks about that God highly exalted Jesus. That is that body has been highly exalted. God has put that body in the place of favor the place of power and the place of the spirit which is right on that throne. That's why the Bible says that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Now you can't see God. You can't see him. He's a spirit. But the scripture says we shall see him as he is. So when he comes back 
He's going to come in that glorified body that he has exalted and put in the place of favor, the place of power, and the place of spirit. Not another person, but his body, which is, belongs to him. Can we say amen? Yes. The son of man, as he puts it in one place. So the right hand of God, the place of favor, the place of power, the place of the spirit. Now let's go to Genesis and look at the place of favor. Genesis chapter 45 and verse number 22. Rachel, I believe this is Rachel giving birth to Benjamin. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 22. And of course, this revelation of this came to us by the late Bishop G.T. Haywood. As God was revealing the oneness of the Godhead, he was pulling the veil back and giving out great revelation concerning himself and Bishop G.T. Haywood, who was the first presiding bishop uh, of the Pentecostalists of the world, was one that gave us this information uh, from the Bible as God revealed it. And it is true, and we're still teaching it to this day. And this was probably over 100 years, almost 100 years ago. And this truth is still being preserved to this day because it is biblical truth. Can we say amen? All right, Genesis chapter 45, so this is what the teachers of the fathers here, that's what we do here, we teach what they taught uh, us. All right, let's read. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. Now, of course, this is Joseph is what he did to Benjamin because Benjamin was highly favored. Now, when Rachel, I said this was Rachel's birth of Benjamin, I was wrong. This is, of course, what we just read. But when Rachel gave birth to Benjamin, her last son, and when she gave birth, she died. Jacob, his father, named him Benjamin. I think she named him Benoni, I think it was, but he named him Benjamin. Uh, and Benjamin means son of my right hand. Now he was the youngest, but he was the most favored. Son of my right hand. He was Jacob's favorite son. And Joseph acknowledged that after meeting his brothers, after being gone from his family for so many years, even though he was not there when Benjamin was born, he still recognized that he was the youngest and the fact that his name was Benjamin meant that he was the son of his father's right hand because his father felt that he had lost his other son, Joseph. So he was highly favored. Let's go to Genesis chapter 48 and verse number 13 through 20. The right hand being the place of favor. 